Hey, Salt Lake, I've got a message for you from the Utah Department of Health and Human Services. In your household, are your pets more immunized than your children? Just like your dog or cat, one of the best ways you can protect your child is to keep their immunizations up to date. Getting your kid to their 12- and 15-month wellness checks will help you stay on the early childhood vaccine schedule. And there's a really cool website where you can find out which immunizations and health screenings your kid needs at every age. It's uptodate.utah.gov. Talk to a doctor or visit up2date.utah.gov to learn more. Salt Lake Society is a fabric store offering high-quality and even eco-friendly apparel fabrics. Whether you're sewing jeans, lingerie, or swimwear. But it is also a vibrant community hub. From Sewing Machine 101 for the nervous beginner to summer camps for kids, Society is for taking classes with friends or making a new one. Find Society in Sugar House online at saltlakesociety.com or on Instagram at Salt Lake Society. Today on CityCast Salt Lake, the Salt Lake City Council is going to debate giving themselves another pay raise. But they just got a 26% pay bump in June, and this is a part-time job. So what's the deal here? And should we just make these full-time jobs? It's Thursday, August 8th. I'm Ali Vallarta, and here's what Salt Lake's talking about. Salt Lake City Council member Darren Mono, you and your colleagues just approved a raise for yourselves and the mayor in this past budget cycle. Council members got a bump from $42,000 to $53,000, but you came here to tell us the council wants more. First of all, how much more? Well, okay, I should first say we're not not all the council, but there are enough council members interested in this for us to have a discussion. We actually indicated that during our budget discussions, uh, if you paid really close attention, which nobody does, we had to pass the legislative intent that we're going to approve the mayor's salary, which automatically gives us the bump that you just mentioned, but that before the end of the year, we're going to readdress that and talk about our salary specifically separate from the mayor's. And so how much more is not yet to be known? And I would say that we're probably all in slightly different places about that. But that conversation is going to be happening this month. So I wanted to make sure the public's aware and and ready to give us their thoughts. Okay. So, I mean, I get that you haven't all agreed on a a number yet. The last bump was 11,000. Do you think it would be in that similar area? Like, is that or much more or much less? Well, where I'm targeting would be a little bit more than that. The reason why we got the $11,000 bump is because right now there's an ordinance that pegs our salary to 25% of whatever the mayor's making. And so if the mayor proposes herself a raise, then that automatically gives us the raise that that a lot of us didn't actually know that's how it worked. I didn't I didn't know at least that it was us tied to that. And if I'm being completely not tinfoil hat, but if I'm just thinking through, I think the reason why that was the case is probably because the last time the council did it, they were just looking for a way to justify a raise and realize that the mayor had continually gotten raises and they hadn't followed. So they thought, well, let's peg ourselves to something. I think the number 25 was arbitrary at the time and it was what felt right then. And so we're, we're looking at that again, trying to figure out what's right for us today. So, yeah, I mean, it does feel like during that part of the budget process, we all learned that a race for the council was tethered to a race for the mayor. Right. Does it go the other direction? As in, if you all raise your salaries, would it raise the mayor's salary again, too? So it depends on the way we do this, right? So we could look at the ordinance. That ordinance is something that the city council can change. Um, did in the past, and we could just change it from 25% to 35% or from 25% to 50%. And that would change our salary without changing the mayor's salary. I think we could also go through and just delaminate it like it originally was and say it's it's unrelated and we're going to consider council raises and mayor's salary independently, and then we could do that. So I don't know, to be honest, Ali, which way we'll go or if it will happen, but I know that there's enough interest in raising the council salary that uh, we're going to talk that through and and see if we can't come to a, a 
a decision on on how to do that. So I don't think anyone's considering raising the mayor's salary more and the council's salary more. It's really playing with whether or not we should be tethered to the mayor at 25%. Part of the reason that the tethering of salaries does make sense is that from a I don't know, from like a PR standpoint, it's easier to message a raise for all parties than like raise after raise after raise. Every time there's a raise, you have to sell it to the public, right? Absolutely. So to that point, it might be hard to sell the public on a raise yet again this year. What's your case for more money here? Yeah, I think that's probably why this doesn't happen very often because council members know that it's politically unpopular for us to say we need more money in order to do this job. Um, but my my justification is, look, I already broke on your show that I'm not going to be running again. And I'm looking at who's going to replace me in this seat. And I'm looking at who has served in the city council in the recent past. And it's only a few you need to be in a specific life situations and able to do this. Either retired, independently wealthy, maybe you have a spouse that's the primary breadwinner, or like myself and most council members right now, you're self-employed. So if you're not in one of those categories and you have a traditional full-time job, you really can't become a Salt Lake City Council member and not have that affect your full-time employment. And I don't want that to be a disqualifying factor for whoever's going to replace me to serve District 5. Yeah. Though I have to say, your term isn't up until January of 2026. So if you approve the raise this year, you will benefit from this raise, not just your successor. Yeah, that's true. And I fully admit that, yes, that is there's a full year. Now I've served for I will have served for four and a half, five years before that. And frankly, I do think that the work justifies a higher compensation. And so I think, yeah, I deserve that. And the other council members deserve that. I believe that. People may disagree. Council members may disagree. Um, But what's more important to me is that the next council member, before the election season starts, this is why for me, it's important that it happens this year, before people really start in earnest deciding whether they're going to run, know that they financially can do it. If you're a teacher or you're, you have a, most people of working age have a, a job that would have to take a back seat if they were to become a council member. I want those people to know that, hey, it's possible for you to do that and still be able to afford to live in your district. There's some financial burdens that will come from being a council member, but I just think that personal financial sacrifice shouldn't be as great as it is right now in order for, for my successor to be able to, to be willing to run. Though, this is a part-time job. When I think about some of the people who are employees of the city, all the people who are employees of the city, they just received a raise as well, but it was only 5%. So you all got a little over 20% bump. City employees only got a 5% bump. So, like, I don't know. Do you think the messaging also will be difficult to employees of the city? I think that that is likely. And I think that this conversation you and I are having right now is probably going to mirror a lot of the conversations you'll see in our council meetings, because I think there are council members that feel the same way and recognize that, you know, our full-time employees only got 5%. Why do we deserve more? It will be one of the issues that I think is we're probably all in different places on. Even council members that agree with me that we should get a raise agree with that for different reasons. I truly don't know exactly where we'll we'll land. I just know that there's enough interest. And my understanding is that it's been scheduled for the end of this month for us to start talking about it in public. Can I tell you something I heard from people when the mayor's salary bump and the council's salary bump earlier this year was being discussed that I thought was interesting was like, folks who said to me like, okay, yeah, but the actual perk, the actual payment for being a local elected official is not the salary for doing the job. It's the friends you make along the way. (laughs) In other words, the connections, the relationships, the access to resources and people who will help you make a lot more money for for your life (laughs) after serving in this office. And I do think, like, yes, we are living in a time of political cynicism. But I also think that is like maybe kind of valid. Like, what do you say to that? Okay. Do I have connections that I wouldn't have had 
prior to city council? Absolutely. I mean, we're having this conversation. I, I, may not, I might not know you at all if, if I wasn't an elected official. So yes, that's the case. But I guess my response would be, do we want people running for office because they want power or because they want to make good choices for our city? And for me, there are going to be people that will run for this office because they want power and they want those connections and they want those perks, those soft perks that come with the job. But I don't want that to be the only reason someone's running for this. I mean, sure, yes, it comes with some additional privilege to be elected in this capacity. I don't want the only people that can have that additional privilege to be people that already have enough privilege that they can afford it. because. The reality is a lot of people could not afford on the salary that we make. It's not nothing, right? But I couldn't afford to live with the family of my size in my district with that salary. And I couldn't have done it if I didn't have outside income and that I didn't own the business so I could choose my own, my own schedule and set my own time. So I have privilege that allowed me to do this. And do I, do I feel like I've done a good job? Sure, but do I feel like that privilege is prerequisite for me to have done a good job? No, I don't, and I, I wanna take that prerequisite away. Hey, Salt Lake. This summer, skip the chaos of delayed flights out of state and enjoy a Park City staycation instead. Escape to the mountains for sunny days and cool nights at one of the Stein Collection properties. There's the Chateau Deer Valley, Stein Erickson Lodge, and Stein Erickson Residences. Now you may think Stein Erickson is just for Hollywood celebrities and their entourages. Not so, my friend. This summer, experience globally ranked five-star luxury at a special price, just for locals. Bring the family and get out of the sweltering Salt Lake heat. Poolside milkshakes, fireside s'mores, games for kids and adults, plus family-friendly dining at special rates. I'm telling you, this summer, Park City is for locals. Call for details, 866-996-0034 or visit steinlodge.com to book your stay. We talk a lot on this show about our city's crown jewels. What are the institutions that open doors in our community and regulate its pulse? I choose Salt Lake Community College, and it is a home for incredibly focused Salt Lakers. Nearly 80% of their students work while going to school, many full-time jobs. If I could do college all over again, I would not be 33 and sitting on these damn student loans. And slick students aren't. 80% graduate with little to no student loan debt or save thousands knocking out credits before transferring to a four-year institution. Every day, Salt Lake Community College is transforming lives and communities through education. If you wanna learn something new, refine a trade, or pursue a higher degree for the first time, explore your options at slcc.edu. Study alongside hard workers, save precious money, and be one in a class of 19, not 100. I hear the case that you're making and I wonder if the solution that shouldn't also be on the table or be discussed here is just making the council a full-time job, right? Like you're saying it's a bigger commitment than a part-time job. If we double this part-time salary of $53,000 a year, we get a, a very a very nice wage salary, in yes. Salt Lake City. Is that something that's being discussed? So I would like us as a city to consider whether or not this should be a full-time job because I look at um, my responsibilities outside of this job and I would do a better job. There are times when I cannot respond to a constituent as quickly as I think that they would like and as, as I would like to do because I have simply, I just have other responsibilities that I have to have. I do think I'd do a better job in some aspects of this. I, I think I'd be more prepared for some of the discussions we have. You know, I can read the agenda, I can look through the packet, but I could spend a hundred hours reading through materials before every Tuesday. I just don't have the time to do all of that. And if this was my full-time job, I could do a better job of it. So I think we should consider that. Now, the reason why the council's not talking about that right now is because that's not a decision we get to make. Um, it's in the city charter 
that the council is a part-time job. So in order to change the city oh. charter, the public has to vote on that. So okay. I don't think we're looking at going all the way to full-time, but just recognizing that it's not a casual part-time job and you'll still probably have to have some outside employment to live very comfortably, but it could be a more part-time casual employment and this would be more primary. And just recognizing that there's financial burdens that come with this. Like I have, I've had to say no to commissions that I've wanted to take because of conflicts of interest. And I mentioned that I had to, my, my family is large. It wasn't this large when I started and I needed to find a place that was bigger in order to fit my family. And I also need to do it kind of urgently because there was a, a safety situation that resulted from me being on the city council where someone kind of doxed me online and I didn't feel comfortable living in the house I lived in. So I had to find a place that fit a six person family in district five. And let me tell you, Ali, that's not easy. So yeah, you're talking like ballpark, very near downtown. Mm -hmm. So I, I really had very few options and I just had to take what, what was there. And luckily I could afford that, but it wasn't easy. And it certainly was, it was far more than double what I was paying before. So there are true financial burdens that come from, from serving on this. And I think that we should recognize that. Yeah, I mean, running for office in and of itself is a very expensive pastime. I want to ask you if there is a recent council decision you think would have been made better if the council was full time. Well, okay, let's just look at the Smith Entertainment Group conversations that we've had. The, we all let's. we we all put <laughs> so many hours into that, and I think we got to a result that was positive, but not without a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And and could we have done a better job of learning about these things earlier or going to more meetings, having more town halls. I don't think it would have been possible for us to do too much engagement on that issue because it was just so large. We did the best we could. I held several roundtables. I hosted several roundtables related to Japantown because I sort of looked at that as, as my issue. But could we have had far more roundtables with the, the community and, and got better thoughts and input? I, I think we could have. And I would have liked to do that, but we didn't have the capacity to. We, we did as much as we could have with our other responsibilities. Well, I'll be interested to see if making this part-time council full-time ends up on the table anytime soon. And it sounds like where it would really need to end up is the ballot. Correct. I want to ask you a bit more about what is on the table, which is a conversation about another raise. So... You all just approved a budget, which was very balanced. So where would this money come from? How do you math it? We have fund balance. And there's every year, we, as the fiscal year goes on, there will be additional revenues or sometimes there will be, have to be cuts. And so if this were a year where we were looking at cuts, we probably wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, I don't think we have any updated tax revenues yet, but we left the budget with a surplus uh, a little bit of a fund balance that we didn't tap into. So it would come out of fund balance. The amount of money, though it's a large in percentage looking at what council makes, it's really, really small in percentage to the overall city budget. So this isn't the type of thing that we're going to need to have any kind of tax increase for, or we're going to have to look at, you know, like the amount of leftover couch cushion money that we find when we did a completed a project and it happened a month faster than we thought that th this isn't something that is going to require a tax increase so we have enough money in the city budget to just pass a budget amendment and be able to fund these salary changes if they get approved i mean basically the whole job of being on the city council is negotiating where to put money when it could be used elsewhere just as well. Absolutely. And so I imagine that's how this conversation is going to go. Like, how do you justify it? Let's say it's, you know, 10,000 bucks a person. We're looking at close-ish to $100,000. Like, let's say it's that amount. How do you justify it instead of something else that serves the whole city? I think some council members might not get to a point where they can justify it. The reason why I feel comfortable at least moving forward and, and indicating that I'm right now I'm supportive of it is because of those things that we've talked about and the reality that I, I really do want, you know, we have a ranked choice election. I really do want a lot of great people to run for my seat and I want to be able to choose my next representative from a pool of very qualified people and I don't want it to just be people that, again, have, have systemic privilege. In, in their life. 
Um, I think when you say choose, you mean as a voter, as a voter. Yes, I, I, I'll get to vote for the next council person. And I want to be able to do that from the, the most qualified pool of candidates. And I think that my constituents deserve that. And I think us as a city deserves that. We, we look at the difference between where we are now and what the councils look like in the past. We have, again, much has been made of the fact that we have the most diverse city council in history. Um, we have a majority LGBTQ and a majority BIPOC city council. That's not something that's happened in the past. And I think if we want that type of representation to continue, I do see this as an equity issue. If we want that type of representation to continue, then we really need to make sure that this is financially possible for everyone that would do a good job serving our city. Salt Lake City Council member Darren Mono, thanks for the heads up. Thanks, Allie. That is all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. Thank you to our founding CityCast Salt Lake members. You can become one at membership.citycast.fm. We will be back tomorrow morning with more from around this city. Bye.